Can't see. We're almost winning. We're just, just uh, connecting to YouTube. Okay. Shanti, we're all good. Let's roll. All right. All right. Good afternoon, all you humans on the interwebs. And thank you so, so much for joining us today for the six Rose Fest Community Conversation Series in partnership with Lifeline. We we're having some technological difficulties over there. So sorry for the two minute delay. My name is Ashanti Kunene, and as always, I am your hostess with the mostest. If this is your first time joining us, I really don't know where you've been the last five Sundays, but for context, the Rose Fest Community Conversations seek to create spaces for us to engage on difficult topics in an open, honest, and candid manner, where we attempt to move past the point of simply problematizing our issues towards actively sharing insights and solutions to help each other heal as people. In conversation with me today are some fantastic people who I'm going to ask to please all switch on your videos so we can see your beautiful faces. We will all take time to introduce themselves when we start. But by way of introduction, we have Dumi Nala, who is the Executive Director of Childline. We have Sandy Lembata, who is a de-schooling father. We have Mantue Pout, a 947 radio DJ. We have Linda Mtoba, who is an actress and mother. And joining us again is Nigua Biela, the director of Lifeline Peter Maritzburg, who are our partners in bringing you these amazing conversations, please, and thank you. So the topic of our discussion today, guys, is the importance of education, of educating young girls and boys, to be honest, because how we are educating young people in the context of a violently patriarchal society like South Africa matters for our healing as people. The saying that it is easier to raise strong children than to fix broken adults rings true for us. So our conversation today is looking at exactly that. In what ways do young girls and young boys need to be educated so that they can grow up to be strong, healthy, and well-rounded individuals? And further than just raising strong, healthy, well-rounded individuals, it's also about raising humans who have the capacity to cultivate healthy interpersonal relationships with other humans. So the data that's coming out of Lifeline and Childline shows that there is a relationship between a person's education and social conditioning and their propensity to accept abusive and toxic interpersonal relationships. So our panelists today are here to help us think through how we educate young girls and boys and how they are socially conditioned, because education and social conditioning can either result in perpetuating the toxic cycles of abuse and acceptance of unhealthy modalities of, be of being, or it can result in producing strong, healthy, well-rounded individuals that can contribute to society in a positive and meaningful way. But before we get into all of that, just a few house announcements. We are recording our session. We're going to be posting the video on YouTube for archive once the live session is over. If data is a concern, please tune in via YouTube as it's more affordable than Zoom. If you have any questions, use the Q&A function on Zoom or the comment section on YouTube, our team is on hand to engage with you during our session. And then lastly, please make sure to like, follow, share, hashtag Rosefest2020, tag all of us make the digital parts happen, yes. So without further ado, I'd like to ask my guests to briefly introduce themselves and tell our guests who are watching today who you are. And yeah, thank you, Mama, you can kick us off. <laughs> Um, I think Mao and Ashanti, it's, it's actually going to be short because of being on the platform a few times. I'm Siniki Wabiela, the director of Lifeline, and we've been part of the conversations from the beginning. So um, yeah, we will we'll actually continue today with the conversations that we have started looking at the education of young girls and young boys in, in changing our society. Thank you. Thank you. Dumi, do you want to come through, Mama? Thank you, Ashanti and everyone. It's really exciting to be in this platform. I'm Dumisile Nala. I, I'm the executive director for Childline South Africa. So we are a child protection organization that works with young boys and girls and families at large. Thank you. Thank you. Wante, please introduce yourself. 
Okay. Hi, my name is Mansui and I am a radio pres uh, presenter and do some TV every now and then. Um, but mainly I'm a radio presenter and I'm very interested in the topic today because it's something that I'm very passionate about. The, the educating of, of young girls in South Africa is something that's very close to my heart. Thank you. Linda? Hi guys, my name is Linda Wagamtoba and I am, first of all, thank you for having me here today. Um, it's such an honor to be such an amazing panelist and such a beautiful, beautiful, smart woman and man um, having such important discussions. My name is Linda Wagamtoba and I am an actress and I'm a mother and this conversation is as well very close to my heart. As a new mom now, I feel like even more than ever before because I understand children and I'm wanting the best for children. So that is something that's very, very close to my heart. I've also started a new foundation called the Linda Mtoba Foundation, which seeks to help our children most. So yeah. Really, really amazing to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And then last but not least, Sandile, do you want to introduce yourself to the people? <laughs> Sanbonani, um, Sandile Mbata, um, maybe I start with gratitude um, to be amongst um, this incredible woman um, uh, panelist, visual panelist. Um, and also to, I hope I don't take up space. So I, for, I, I want to always, you know, um, uh, apologize in advance because as men we take up a lot of space um at least yeah i was invited i'm hoping i'm not taking too much space i'm just also here um i'm a i'm a a recovering academic um uh, i work late um and a father of two beautiful girls that's my wife there in the corner in the little corner on the side closing so the kids don't step um I, I'm very passionate about how we raise our children. I think a crisis of what we have and the crisis of, of violence in this country um, is, is, is in, the, in the crisis of how we raise children, especially young boys, um, to, to, to behave themselves and, and, and to be better humans. So I'm really excited about this conversation today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you all for taking the time to be here to engage with me on this conversation today. Like, I'm really excited. So to kick off, I'm going to give it to you, Sandela, because you were already speaking about the, you know, the violence within our society. So in thinking about how young people are educated today, what do you think is needed from an educational standpoint to raise and produce strong, healthy, well-rounded individuals? If we are saying that the education system is broken, we're not, that's not what we're debating today. So, but what do we do then, if that's the case? Do we spend time trying to fix an already broken system? Or do we spend time looking for alternatives of de-schooling, unschooling, homeschooling? Like what, what is the situation? And Sandile, if you can kick us off there. Yeah, there's a, no, thanks. Uh, 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 thanks, Ashanti. I think there's quite a lot of, of um, a de-schooling that has happened in our minds. Um, so I hold, I, I keep on being asked this question, why do you de-school your children, unschool your children if you have a PhD? So I, I hold a PhD for my sins, uh, having gone through the entire system. Um, I, I think a lot of what we need to do is a shift of mindset. First of all, to recognize that the schooling system itself has failed not only our children, but has failed us too. Um, and there's quite a lot of, um, healing that we need to go through, especially as, 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 as black parents, because we risk a lot of passing, passing on our generational trauma to our children, so that then our children, again, pass it on to their children, and we have the current crisis that we have. So that recognition that the schooling system is not going to help us, uh, only any, any institutionalized education where education is monetized and it's based on hierarchical structure and patriarchal structure, we must recognize that it's not going to help us and, and it's not the system that we want, we want to continue with. Um, and then recognize that there's various um, educational um, uh, sort of platforms or ways of, of, of allowing our children to, to learn because I, mean, I don't think we have a capacity to educate any children ourselves because we still continue to learn. Um, so the humility in, within us should say, what are sort of better learning opportunities that we can provide for our children? Because it is better learning opportunities. It's not paying 50,000 Rand for an overrated education system, um, but it's more saying, what is better for our children? Because I mean, children will rather just play the whole day. Um, mm. you, so it's exploring the sort of different systems. So what we do in this household is that all our children are, are unschooled. So there's no curricula that they follow. They learn what they want to learn as and when they want to learn it. Um, and there's a lot of questions, of course, you get from families. Like, what are they going to be? I mean, we're not, we're not arriving. We didn't come on earth so that we could become something. We just want to leave the earth 
um, to make sure that we contribute to this earth being a better place. Um, so there's quite a lot. I, 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 mean, I don't want to sort of exhaust everyone in the subject matter here, but I think there's quite a lot of options that are out there. But it starts with the shift of mindset to that success. Um, that's that's some that's my soundtrack um, of, of of fatherhood. Um, so it's that recognition to say, as parents, we have a responsibility to completely and radically change how we think of our children, first of all, as well. They are a, a active social agents, and there's a lot of things for us to learn from them. Um, and we're not educating them, and we cannot educate our children, in fact. We can provide better learning opportunities. So uh, for me, this is, I mean, it's a really, really interesting um, uh, conversation because I think it really touches on what we haven't been touching on because it, as much as it's about children, but it's mostly about us as well because yeah, quite often yeah. parents take their kids to school for, 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 for their own gratification so that, you know, you take your school to, and parents always ask you, so which school do your kids go to? So you must, must mention a very expensive school. So it means that yeah. you really care about your children. So anyway. So, yeah, so, okay. you're giving us... You're giving us a lot of food for thought there to kick us off. So maybe I want to take to Linda as a new mom. What do you think about what Cindy is saying about that we require a radical shift of mindset in terms of providing better learning opportunities for our kids? And that doesn't necessarily correlate to sending them to the most expensive schools. What do you think? You're, I, unmute yourself, mama. <laughs> I did not want to speak because I also have a background soundtrack happening. So that also comes in now and then. <laughs> so sorry about that. I'm, I'm saying that I definitely do share his sentiments in that regard. We need to do a lot of shifting, even as new parents, like, you know, looking at even how the educational structure is changing in, dare I say, first world countries compared to where we are now. We still do very conventional education in terms of our kids. Like you go to school, we phone grade one, you've got to be tricky, you have to be a doctor, you have to be an engineer. Those are still labels that are taken upon us and deemed as successful, you know? Where there's, as you said, success is literally just depending on what you want to achieve as the person. So I think that obviously also would impact how you want to raise your kids. And in terms of them acknowledging what success actually even means in the grand scheme of the thing, you know? Um, in terms of educating them, I would say that I really love what's currently happening in some schools where it's not a normal curriculum. You know, some schools aren't even wearing uniform anymore. It sounds like a small step, but to me it's a big step because uniform isn't a basis of education. You don't need to be dressed up in a certain manner for you to be able to understand what your teacher is saying. What you wear has nothing to do with what you've been taught. So I feel mm -hmm. like, first of all, them maybe removing the uniform part of it, something that I like and resonates with me, is the fact that kids are actually able to be kids and able to actually be themselves and explore themselves, how they feel and how they see fit for themselves, you know? And also, in the sense of, um, there's a lot of schools now as well that have that learn to play element of it. You know, I'm, I'm also a person that doesn't want to force my kids to be the most um, knowledgeable person. Gosh, a book is a book. You know, whether they want to read a book about mathematics, great. But if they want to read a book about the philosophy of life, they want to read a book about just how life is, they don't even want to read a book and listen to music, that also should be okay. Because education isn't one line. There's no normal education, technically speaking. There shouldn't be. Because all kids are different and all kids learn differently but we live in an era and in a time where mainstream education is exactly where it is right now so I feel like obviously doing your research as a parent and, and first identifying your parenting skill will matter and also just how you want to see how you want to raise your kids also matters I think from that get-go from the onset knowing the things that want to work for you as a parent and you don't want to work for you you know doing your research it's really important to do research I'm thinking I think I'm sure that Sandy has done plenty of research that has put put him in this position that he is in today to be able to make those concise decisions about the future of his kids and even his, his future you know so I feel like it's really important to actually have this knowledge and actually see that there are alternatives there are there is alternative learning you know there is homeschooling there is learning on, on, on our computers kids have had to do it for a long time and they're doing it now and dare I say that even as a young having a daughter even makes me more scared to unleash her into this world you know in as much as I do want her to be exposed to it it's very harsh especially for our little girl you know like every day we read what's happening to women and, 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 and honestly my body just gets so shocked and it's really just really scary what's happening to women in South Africa specifically here so do I want to even unleash her into this world it's another discussion maybe we'll We'll touch on that a bit later on today. But I would say when it comes to education point of it, there's plenty of options when it comes to educating your kids. And educating your kids should be what you want them to learn. And obviously, the more they grow, the more they'll tell you what they want as well. Kids are very vocal. So let's just let them lead the way. Obviously, you pave it, but let them continue on their own path. 
Yeah, I think that's so interesting what you said about, you know, having a daughter, do I even want to unleash her into the world? I think that's also the crux of the conversation, right? Because the function of education is about producing particular kinds of people for a particular kind of society. What kind of society are we trying yeah. to create? What kind of humans do you want within that society? And is it a one where you are comfortable enough to unleash your daughter into the world? Mm. You know, like that is that is the crux of that is the things. crux of it, really. Mm. Yeah. So Monty, I want to bring you in here. What do you think about what our panelists are saying, you know, about the, um, the conversation? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a parent yet, um, but I absolutely agree with the fears that parents could have when it comes to the quality of education or educating that's happening in the country. Um, we unfortunately end up with people that are not well-rounded individuals because it's not done from an early age, right? It's like the school is doing one thing and the home is doing the other. Um, mm. And kids are different people in the different structures and systems. Um, I think at a very young age, girls particularly are taught that being a mom or being a certain kind of woman is a part of their identity. Um, and with boys from a very young age, they taught that achieving certain goals and being a stronger guy, a stronger person is at the core and the fiber of who they are. And I think it, it gets lost right there and it starts very early. It starts at home. Um, we can, we can look to the education system all we want and find fault, but there's a lot of fault that happens in our South African homes when it comes to how girls feel about themselves before they even go to school. Um, mm -hmm. so a lot of that needs to be and learned at home, I think parents, and I'm glad that we have young parents. And when I'm listening to Linda and Sandile, picking up how I think my parents weren't thinking like this. So you can see that we're going in the right direction with how hands-on parents are with mm. what they allow their kids to be exposed to or um, 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 yeah, exposed to and what they won't allow. So I think it, it, it's slow, but it's progress because the reality is that there's a lot of faults that happens at home with how well-rounded a person is yes. uh, before you even get to the education system. And kids, yeah. to, kids need to understand that, not even kids, I think our government needs to get to a point where we understand that human beings are different. I think that cliche is so overlooked that we really are putting kids in one system and we're expecting different human beings to thrive in one thing that's not catering for everyone. Yeah, well, that's one size fits all, yeah. Yeah, and education, raising a well-rounded individual can never be a one size fits all thing. Kids are different. When when you're an autistic kid in school, you know, growing up, I'm sure Linda knows this, you are the different and loud one. And But you're in a space that doesn't cater for that unless, unless you go to an art school. Um, mm. When you're a very smart kid, you quickly go to a next grade. Like, I think our education system is not catered to... to Individuals. To, Everyone, yeah, it's not. And it's definitely yeah. impossible to, to cater to every single being. And that's why we need to blast this thing wide open and, and find other ways to educate kids and, and raise a well-rounded nation. Yeah, I think what you say is so profound, especially when you talk about the disconnect between what's happening at home and what happens at school, right? And yeah. last week in our conversation, I can't remember who it was, but they said that you need a license to drive a car, guys. Yeah. Yeah. But to have a baby, there's like you don't That's need nothing. any kind of license. But a, a ha raising a child, a human, is so much more complicated than operating a car. How, like, how does this work? So um, I want to bring Jimmy here in from a childline point of view. What do you see, Mama? What do you think we need to be doing to be educating and raising well-rounded people? <laughs> Thank you. I, I think in the discussions now, um, one is already learning a lot. Uh, there are very radical proposals in terms of, not proposals, but actions that people are putting in place in terms of schooling. And I think to some extent, parenting their children. But for me, I think at the core of it, as a parent, you are raising your young ones so that they have a, a better future whichever way you define that future. And I think currently, of course, is in, it is in monetary terms as in they will lead a better life, they will have more money, they can afford the things that they want to afford in life. But whichever way we look at schooling and learning, 
I think at the core, as a parent, you want your child to, to live a, a better life and they can define that for themselves. As we were saying, you can help them along the way to define that. But we also know that we have parents who, um, as most parents are still confined in terms of the traditional ways of doing things. You know, the mainstream schooling, that is what parents know or most parents know. And that is almost like the only way of doing things. It's exciting though to hear that there are alternatives and, and people need to look at what is best for, for your child. And it is a transition that has to take place. It may not come easy for some, but the discussions need to, to start taking place. I think for sure, I mean, COVID-19 has taught most of us as parents that we are definitely not teachers at all. You know, the academic aspect and having to do maths and science, it, it, it's just not happening because that's not where we are at. But it's also about as a parent, be it you looking at a conventional way of teaching and learning or a, a, a more radical or a different way of doing things, that education and, and bringing up children doesn't only happen in a classroom. So it's also about how, be it you are not learned, uh, you are umama from Emma Kaya, but it's also about creating that conducive environment so that your child can learn. So at home, how do you create that conducive environment so that when they get to school, they are able to absorb whatever the teacher or whatever is happening at that time is beneficial for them? Mm -hmm. No, thank you so much. I think that's so insightful. And Simi, if you want to come in here <laughs> and engage on what Jimmy has said. Um, uh, thank you, Ashanti. I think. Uh, for me, I agree with all the panelists that have just um, said a lot about education and the current system of education that we have um, in South Africa. Um, and truly, there is no one educational system that one can pinpoint and say this is the right one and this is the one that we need to follow um, as a country. I will say both formal and informal education um, that happens, whether at home or at school or via friends, it all has um, strengths and also has some weaknesses. So normally parents tend to believe that if the child goes to school, that's where this, the, the learning should take place. And they think actually they don't have a role or an active role that they need to play in uh, making sure that the um, a, a child um, learn. But also what at times is seen as the biggest mistake of parents they then um, think that it's not even their responsibility. So the teacher must uh, teach because they're paying or even if they're not paying that that's so much money, but because they've paid some money, uh, the teacher must um, pay. We've also know that there are kids that will reach up to grade seven, failing to actually complete simple forms with the name and their surname, like simple details they just can't do but they've actually moved up to grade seven and you could see that they're going to high school, but they're not actually, um, they can't uh, read or write. But I just want to say, looking at all these um, um, different ways of um, teaching our children, um, I wouldn't say we must throw um, the baby with the water. Um, there are a lot of um, uh, broken things in the traditional educational system that we're seeing. And I think it's getting even more are broken now that we see people finishing metric and they can't even fill in the forms. But we also know that some of the um, things that are happening in school could also be beneficial. Um, I'll make an example. Some um, young kids or, or girls come from families that will not open their mouth and talk about sexuality at all. Then they go to school, they go through LO, which then opens up a discussion to actually learn um, on, on sexuality and they learn um, on other things and how they can behave. So even though the system is broken, I want to say there are certain things in the system that they can be promoted and that we can actually utilize them to actually make this um, our um, education better. But it, it depends again on who's teaching that particular subject. 
At times, parents, as much as we want them to take an active role, but how many of the parents of these young girls and boys are educated themselves? Will they be able to really assume this responsibility of educating their kids so that one day they can become independent and they can go into um, a job or actually start their own businesses even if they don't get employed? So how much information do they have as parents? At times we want them to do um, and contribute and they're scared of contributing because they actually not confident enough in themselves to say they can do this. So in the, it looked like it's, a, it, it's made different, different processes before we could get where we want to be because we want parents to play an active role, but we have parents that are very scared and shy because they, they think they don't know much about education. And how then do we help them realize that actually education is not only about what is happening in the classroom, but as I'm a panelist have said, it's also what is happening at home that most of the times gets ignored. You know, I've heard a number of parents saying, hey, when what are you learning in school? Is your teacher teaching you this? And I always think, so what are you teaching them? You blaming teachers through and through, and you're expecting teachers to be good and change this behavior of this child. But as a, a, a parent, you just lay back and relaxing and thinking somebody else must assume the responsibility. So for me, I think we need a system that will allow our young boys and girls to think outside the box, that will not actually box them, that they will be free to actually think outside the box and be allowed to actually do what they want to do and actually to pursue the careers that they would like to pursue, not being actually boxed into you will study until matric before you go to varsity, before you do this. Yeah, yeah. I think that's so important. Yes, Linda, you want to say something? Yeah, right? sorry. I just want to say yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> simply because when I'm listening to her now, I want to actually speak about the importance of certain lessons taught in school that maybe if we highlighted those lessons, I'll, take my, I'll, I'll say the one that we all thought, oh, we need to just pass this, the easiest thing to pass, life orientation. How important life orientation actually is in school. I feel as if now more than ever, especially in our climate, kids need to have an outlet where they actually know more about life in general. They know more about their bodies. They know more about the person and the, the person next to them. With uh, as I'm, I'm also Sniggo said before that some households kids are too scared to even talk about sexual um things in the home. You know, then how does a child talk about this? Saying that maybe I'm being touched inappropriately when at home they can't even say the name vagina. Do you know what I mean? Like. It's, takes things like that where kids need to learn and understand their bodies. So life orientation, I think right now was really, really needed. I think about, I think back at it now and the importance of it, that we're actually able to get tools that actually carry us with us through life. You know, most mm. of us did mathematics. I had to, nothing I do right now has to do with maths in my life. Like mm. there's nothing that I, that, that I do that needs mathematics, but everything that I do, every interaction that I has, has to do with life orientation, having life skills. You know, yeah, and I was speaking to yeah. my friend um, earlier and I took out just a thing, embroidery, you know, and this may sound weird, but I love the fact that even like schooling long ago had such subjects. It had embroidery, it had woodwork, it had um, 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 mechanical stuff for the kids to do. It had home home economics, you know. I think now more, people need those skills to carry themselves on because you need to be able to be self-sustaining in South Africa. And that's mm -hmm. just the truth of it. You can't rely on employment because our unemployment rate is so sky high that you need to, in some weird way, find a niche of something that you can do for yourself. So I feel like mm -hmm. starting mm -hmm. in school, having those things like home economics, there's so many people that I know now that take up cooking. Like during lockdown, we all want to restaurant food. Who did we call? We call people that we know that know how to cook. You know, but now not everyone has that skill of obtained. How will you know that you want to be a chef if you've never even held a spoon at school before? You know, how do you mm -hmm. know that you want to be a, a tiler? You know, when you've never had anything to do with even trying to build a house in, in, in a school. You know, teach mm. you all about these theories that at the end of the day, you actually can't carry on with your life and take with you in the sense of the word, like you can't, you don't have skill work. And I feel like mm. skill work is a needed thing right now. So maybe even including those things in education would really help a lot. You know, long ago, people were able to build their own houses from the ground up based on things that they learned at school. You know, I feel like those are the kind of skills right now that in terms of it were to reintroduce them to the educational part, it would really be great. You know, like highlighting life orientation, yeah. 
highlighting skill stuff because not everyone is first of all gifted into in, like in terms of intellectual gifting i, I want to put it in a broad way of saying that you know that some people are skilled labor workers you know being a plumber being a tiler and um, being a car mechanic all these things here yeah, that sometimes you can't even get the skill because people are not smart enough to go to school for it, which really is not the case. People live mm. well and they make lots of money based on skills that they have and they're able to actually teach the next person. So I feel mm. like having things like that will surely, surely in some way, I feel like it would be beneficial to South Africa and in, 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 as a whole. Yeah, so what I'm hearing, that's great. That's great. I'm there with you, Mante. I think what I'm hearing is that the structure is not so important. It's the content of what we're giving our kids. It's the content. It's like, what are they learning? Not how, the how is yeah. a superfluous yeah. thing. It's the what, you know? So speaking, and that relates to uh, what this new girl said about not throwing the baby out with the baby water, mm. which is an amazing segue to the second question, which essentially speaks to the content of the education, right? What are the educational messages that we're giving young kids, both at home and at school? And I think, contextualizing that into, you know, the uh, theme of gender-based violence we were talking about, that would it be fair to say that girls are conditioned into accepting patriarchal mm -hmm. dominance and boys are conditioned into exerting patriarchal dominance in this broken uh, uh, system, given how things have, given the kinds of people that our education system has produced and the society those people have created, like, you know, what is the messaging and, and where do we shift now? how those messages land with young young kids who wants to pick that up somebody pop <laughs> i come in before i i mean I'm, I'm really enjoying these conversations but possibly one of the things that i'll be critical of is is referring to a school system as an educational system it's it's more a schooling system um okay. and it's difficult to not to talk about the the messed up nature of the schooling system um to talk about the current situation that we find ourselves in without highlighting how messed up the, 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 the schooling system is. Because personally, I think the schooling system is the foundation of patriarchy, of patriarchy because that's where it, it's all taught. And um, it's taught at home, it's taught in schools, but it's also part of the system, right? Um, it, it never, as, as a parent, I've always asked myself a question, um, do I have friends that are all my age? I'm, 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 I'm 37 years old. Do I have all 37 year olds as my friends? No, it's not true. So why is my, why are my kids, why is my kids sitting with all 37 year, uh, six year olds at the same time in class? Um, why are they being in a conveyor belt that they must learn the same thing? Um, they not learning. I mean, I like what what Linda was saying, um, of sort of various. Uh, skills that aren't really elevated in society, but they are very key. They are very important. We don't teach our kids how to be emotional, to allow themselves to be emotional. And um, we tell young boys, be a man. So part of the, just moving to the next question, or trying to deal with the next question is saying, it's not only, the challenges are not only coming out of the education system itself, but it's coming from the language itself as a system, culture as a system, home, dynamics as a system. So for, first, of, first of all, I grew up in a rural area of Northern KZN. And um, I know phase, phrases like, don't, don't be a girl, don't run like a sissy. So what do those things mean? What, what, do, what kind of boys are you raising if you keep on telling them that? You say, you, basically, you're just saying to them, um, a, a girl child, your sister is lesser than you, cannot do what you can do. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a process with my wife of raising rebel girls to say, you can do anything, anything you want to Rah, do. Yes. Part of what we need to change is the language. It's, 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 yes, the content is important, but the language that we use at, ho we use at home, don't cry, be okay. No, let the boy cry. I have 15 year old, most emotional person who knows how to deal with his emotions because the, the, the gender-based violence is coming out because these very young boys and um, the young, the men that we have now have no emotions because being emotional as a man is like, why, why are you being a sissy? And we frown upon our own little boys at home That's when me. they cry and they're being emotional. And you're like, where should they be emotional then if they're not going to lie on, on Mama Linda's chest and cry? And you say, what's, mm. what's, let's talk about that. You know what I mean? So I think that for me, that's the big, big, big issue that we not, as parents, we are not, we are, sort of French, I don't know, it's, it's what's the word, of um, sort of giving away education of our children to, to the system, right? The system is, is, is governed and the state has never cared about us. We must understand that I work for the state and I know the state doesn't care about people. It cares about ensuring that the system continues, you create the zombies that continue to want to work. Why do we have 
30% unemployment. The unemployed people are the same people who've gone through universities. So somehow we keep on keep we keep on this picture that if you have a, a university degree, you will get employed. But Linda is saying, well, you can learn these skills and actually start your own business. You don't even have to learn them in school. In fact, you can be an artisan without having to go to school. You mm -hmm. can learn anywhere. Education exists outside of a classroom, exists outside of an institution. Because oh. once you give away that opportunity to, 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 to teach your child or to guide the, the learning process of your child, you are then exposing your child to a lot of issues and trauma that they'll go through and you have to deal with it. And we are still going through trauma. I mean, I'm still scared. When it's a Sunday afternoon, I'm thinking, oh, shucks, what's happening? Because, you know, it was a school the following day. There's a, a teacher who's going to beat the hell up out of me because I didn't do the homework. You know, there's a whole lot of traumas, these small traumas, and they just keep on coming back all the time. And we're not really paying attention to it. So I think for me is we pay attention as parents. We take ownership of our education system. Whether you decide for a school, or you decide to homeschool or unschool, any other type of education, but as a parent, you need to be a centerpiece of that learning process. Mm, no, can I come in there? I think we've, we've, got a, we've got a very flawed, okay, maybe let me put it like this. I feel like parents are also outsourcing parenting from from the system to raise right to raise their kids i think there's a there's a very failed and maybe it was tested before because we used to have homework diaries and our parents used to sign them i'm helping raise my brother and i've never heard of a homework diary that you have to see what happens at school before you even see the reports day-to-day -day things and keeping up with what it is that they're doing and what they're learning i think there's a failed osmosis that used to exist between schools and home that just disappeared. Like I said earlier, I, and I'll keep stressing this, I feel like the schooling system, thank you for teaching us a new uh, term. Yes. The schooling system um, is running its own thing and parents are also doing their own thing. And, and kids are left to exist between these two things and decide as and when they're going to be whatever character they display. Like Linda said earlier, some kids aren't free enough at home to have any kind of conversation with their parents. Therefore, you, they shine better in some, uh, some conversations at school. And parents then also then find themselves in a situation where Low, yeah, pop, or you, you, we don't understand this child, but you don't know the child. You're raising them and parents want to raise kids by order and not mm. by coexisting and, and, and communicating. You know, mm. And I think that's the osmosis man of family and, and, and schooling has failed and I think we had it very uh, high in terms of quality this is what happens at school and at home and like the flow was there ah. and I think we just don't know what kids are learning and what's happening at school and kids are coming from one machine of home and community of patriarchy getting thrown into another system that's also doing the same thing mm. 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 Um, I, 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 I actually love what you're saying. I think it will even go back to what you actually mentioned earlier on in terms of that our kids' education does begin, begin at home. Yeah. You know, how we raise our kids in the house plays a very vital role in who they actually become in school, at work, just in life in general, and how they see the world, you know? So I think in that sense of, of, of I like we're saying now, with that relationship between the school and um, the parenting element of it, um, I think my, my, my man just complains all the time about her kids being bombarded with homework, you know? Mm -hmm. And she is a single parent who has a partner, but she works hard and she works a lot. You know, so I feel like now it goes back to the whole thing of saying that we're told to go to school, get an education, to get a job and to work hard. And now when you work hard, sometimes you can't really be a great parent. So it's all about finding that balance, which is really, really hard. You know, both parents sometimes wake up in the morning at eight o'clock, they go to work, they're at work at eight o'clock, excuse me. The only interaction they get with their kids is when they are leaving in the morning in the car and when they're coming back in the afternoon, if they even have time for homework because parents are exhausted, maybe they even have their own work that they've taken in from the office and doing it inside the house. And that happens a lot of the time. You know, we live in a space where we are literally just working people 
all the time if you even mm. have the privilege of having a job first of all and mm. now that obviously puts in another pressure of wanting to maintain your job of wanting to perform well at school of trying to stay afloat especially right now with how we actually are dealing with this pandemic while we were um with the fact that everything is so insecure parents are feeling insecure you know and trying mm. to educate your kid and being a mom and being a friend and having a social life it's really is a lot but it mm. also does go back to that parenting element of saying, it's okay, goodness, you made a decision to be a parent, first of all. You decided mm. that you wanted to be a parent. Now let's step up and be the parents that you said you wanted to be because you want to be a parent. Now you're here, now they're parents. You know, that as you said, you need a license to drive a car. There is no book, there's no license that comes with a baby. You don't get to test drive it first and have a little bumps in the corner, you know, scratch it here and there. There's no driving school. You just literally get thrust at the baby into your arms and you're just expected to raise it. But I think that but encrypting yourself with tools that help you make sane decisions and good decisions really plays a role. Having small things like having, okay, even no matter how busy I am in the day, let me take 30 minutes just to check up on my child. How are you doing? How is school doing? You know, having that, that, that emotional conversation. Intellectual ones are great and they're very frustrated, they're very frustrated for the child and the parents for them to have those educational conversations. If you yeah. can afford to have someone to help with the educational part of it, because you're not a teacher yourself, you know, mm. have emotional education with your children. Have one-on-ones mm. where you guys play together, you talk together, you ask them how you are, how are you feeling, how's your heart? Let the boy cry, let the girl cry. Let the boy hold mm. on to you a little longer than he does normal nights, you know what I mean? Let your children be children without boxing them. Even the terminology, I love the Sunday mentioned that, plays such a vital role in how we navigate our lives, you know? We have young girls wanting to play touch rugby or like rugby, like, ah, that's a boy's game. You know, mm-hmm. who said it's a boy's game? You know, who said anything is gender-based? It shouldn't be gender-based because skill, education, our physicality, we both, we both we have two legs, we have two arms, we both mm-hmm. are able in the same way. Why is it genderized? You know, I think it even begins in a, in, 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 in a small thing. Like, I, w- I will say an example where I took Bean out playing and there was like, we're in a park with another little boy, you know. Posted about it, it was very beautiful. I enjoyed that moment, you know. And then you get people coming in with the connotation, oh, finally, let's go, oh, Oh, I'm just like, no, 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 my love. No, 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 no. Now that's what we're not going to do because these are just being kids. Let kids be kids without their gender being the first thing first about their identity. Let them first be a child foremost. They don't even know that they're a boy or a girl. Let them just enjoy their life. You know, let them be kids and let them be in a safe space to be kids without already putting in so much, inst- like so much pressure of them having to amount to someone. Young girls must already grow up knowing that they must be wives, that they must have children. Why? Young boys grow up knowing mm-hmm. that, yo, I ain't got defined. I even not look, not look, not look, not look. By the way, pe- patriarchy, so I understand the no. no. why it's still a really important thing because now what the best so, man, it's an I learned as a mother of the first and then I was giving me like, guys, please, hey, no, no, no. Whoa, I'm sorry, yes, girl. Yeah. That's like, amazing. Like, my, my I love water. what you're saying. I love what you're saying, because I wait, think it's just... Wait, wait, Sorry. Sorry, Sorry Sandile. I, Dumi, wanted to say something a few mm. chats ago, so I just want to let her come in here. Yes. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, I, I actually wanted to pick up on what Usandile has said, but Linda has also kind of uh, expressed that very well. It's an in India by patriarchy and how we raise boys and girls. It's a color called And the manner in which right from the time they are born, we've already categorized them. Gutumdana will grow up this way. And then it just continues. But what also I see is Nazi Siyama organizations working with children. There has been a big movement in terms of empowering girls. And there are programs and activities that empower girls so that they can be strong, independent, and kind of fight for their rights. But what happens, we then leave boys behind. And then it becomes a problem when you have empowered girls and boys who are left behind. Yeah. And, and that is a problem on its own. And I think we need to be able to have those conversations about and Bong and Goba, they are going to continue living a life as a Bepila Bonge in our society. And Absolutely. at the end of the day, we end up marrying those men that were not being pumped Great. with, that we were pumped with. Yes. Because, you know, I love this because my mom, 
my mom always goes on about this you know she's like you know it's we're all about empowering the the, the 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 girl child make sure the girl child gets an education and yes it is needed girl child do need a bit more of a step up in life i 100 agree with that because of patriarchy and all that stuff i completely agree with that but now we're going to raise this empowered strong woman with men that can't engage with them with now obviously leads to the men already feeling less because of patriarchy them not feeling inadequate to have these great women them wanting to cut the woman to size but in south africa the, the word cut is a literal and a figurative cut. speech Ooh. because they do cut us to size you know I so think, that I is something we also need to actually monitor is that we need to raise children strong children emotionally strong children emotionally equipped um, children especially with our boys especially with our girls because why is the onus always on us to always take it why are they not being told to stop it why are they not being told to not do that why are they not being raised to be better and do better you know because it's women who's always trying to figure things out but it's then the thinking i live as in that zone is there too we're not creating these problems they're literally been brought upon us by men and in terms of not raising the, the, these these young men in the way that we actually would like them to be you know for them to actually socialize and interact with us is a problem that starts very 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 young at a very young age so those are things that are really really are needed like i just love what you said because it is so important to actually educate and have emphasis on boy children and empowering boy children to be strong 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 men you know and by the word strong i mean strong emotionally men i don't care about a man to mundo mina but wait i want to care about mundo ngaphakathi nangala what's important to me as the person yeah. I feel like that's the most important thing that people should actually have umqondo nenhliziyo yakuthi njani amandla akho no one fights anymore no one's going to war so why do you mm-hmm. want to fight anyway there's no wars going on you know so let's actually be emotionally and um, and intellectually equipped that's really what i think for boy children would actually need and have an emphasis on them too you know linda i i think what she's saying um it's actually very true also with all other panelists um including um dumi I think there are there are some changes that are happening and the shifts in terms of recognizing um girls and women um especially if you look at even with the formal schooling you see now that we see more and more girls taking um engineering as a career going through medicine but and we're also looking even when you look at the government there are laws now that speaks to PEE and the black economic empowerment and pushing companies to give senior positions to women and girls so that they can also be in charge but where the problem is lacking is exactly what you guys are saying because that message hasn't filtered down into the families and to the homes we are still raising boys that are told every day that they need to be um the providers in their own families so all especially men that we are seeing today were told from the time they were very small that they need to be provided but when the system was changed and the system now is promoting more um women and girls into senior position nobody has gone back to actually deal with these boys that have been groomed and told from the time they were young they're going to be in charge now to their surprise they marry senior who's the director of lifeline now who's in charge and of course that messes up the entire family because this man now believes i'm going to be in charge through and through and then rolls at him even if they're capable in terms of their knowledge and skills but they don't get promoted anymore because of the bee but nobody deals with that anger there are no programs really that are out there to to help them actually understand and also to just talk about their frustration of course they come home they very angry because they know that they qualify for that position but because of their gender they did not get it it was given to this a woman now because of bee but when are we going to start at home educating our boys and actually let them understand it's okay not to be a provider there is nothing wrong with actually not being the main provider because from what we're seeing at lifeline we see a lot of women that comes to lifeline beaten up because now the men is jealous that they're not asking for money anymore whereas previously they used to beg and ask for money for bread and milk and now the woman is working and they get hiding exactly for that because now they think they are okay but when you listen to it nicely it's just the fears that are coming from the deep down of this man now that all along was made to believe he's going to be god in this woman's life and now that is not happening so i think i agree with all the panelists that the problem is at home and how we're going to actually go into the deeper level and when 
programs are implemented or changes are being made, they are made at a higher level. Like the BEE things get changed up, up there and companies get told, this is what you're gonna be doing going forward. We need 50% of women um, sitting in management position. But nobody is managing the fallout of those rules that have been actually implemented. And how then do we change the messages from the beginning of the beginning at home so that your five-year-old boy and your four-year-old boy knows that it's okay not to be in charge of the family. It's okay to earn less than your partner. It doesn't, it's not a sign of being a failure to earn less than your partner because you're in a partnership. You don't have to always have more money than him. So I think it's high time really we go back and we make sure that at the family level, these things are addressed and we raise a boy child in a way that he understands that it's okay even if I have a partner that ends more than me, that is more powerful, or that is actually a celebrity and I'm not, it's still okay because then we complement each other. At the moment, yeah. they don't understand the theory of complementing each other. They want yeah. to be first or nothing. Yeah, thank I think, you so much. Sugar. Sorry, sorry, I, I cut off Sandile earlier for a comment. Please say if you still remember what it is you wanted to say. <laughs> There's so much, there's so much fire. So there's, there's a storm here already because of, of the fire that I'm getting from, from the wind. It's such a fantastic conversation. I don't know if you can still hear me. It's um, some serious thunder. So uh, can you hear me? Yes, you can hear you. Yes, yes. Okay. It's, it's so much. I think it's the possibly the best analysis of why there's gender-based violence in this country is what um, Bensile and Lindy and, uh, and Sneaky will now have highlighted. You raise the bar in terms of ensuring that you are raising and empowered young, uh, young women or women in general. You leave the boys on the side floating in, their, in the confusion and fear um, and um, the innocence of the patriarchy that has told them that they will be in charge. And when that clashes, then they become violent because we are taught to be violent at a very young age. Um, I grew up in a culture and a system that teaches you to be violent. And I, I'm not sure how many of you grew up in rural areas where coming from school, someone would put a sand um, or soil in front of the two of you and says, whoever hits it to the other person, um, you're not scared, so you are stronger. So that person says, I'm scared, they pull up soil, they embarrass, they go. So it's a system that embarrasses these young boys. You always have to fight, physically fight in order to um, to fill your manhood, and that's your that makes you feel like a man. So I think it's possibly the best an analysis of why we have this gender-based violence. But the question again is, what do we do about it? Um, I personally do think that the sooner we shift away from the binary of raising a young boy and a young, young girl, we will win as parents. In my house, I don't say, Go, because you're a girl, go wash the dishes. Even if I don't say it in that language, I don't do things that are fully within the system because I've understood that this, the system is a value chain. So education is just one of many systematic value chains. So the fact that we are working every day and we have to um, sort of franchise or outsource our parenting, our parenting um, is, is part of that system. Uh, the system says once you've educated, then you're going to get a job and you're going to work from nine to five. And we can talk about whether, as a human being, you can be productive from eight, for eight hours a, week, a day. I mean, it's, it's, it's just it's a no-brainer. There's so many things in the system that we just can't, we don't question. Um, and I think to go back to what the question that Ashanti posed is, what can be done? Is first of all, recognizing that the system has no interest uh, of our society at heart. How do we break down the system? And I think what Dumisil, what Linda, what, what all the panelists are saying is that we need to dismantle it. But if you are kind to the system and saying, you know what, I want to babysit the system um, as I navigate around it, you will not. I mean, I, Linda, you were, you were highlighting a very important, important point. What happens to parents that both of them are required to work? Because they've been put in a system that says, both of you must have income and you must go around and explain your success because your success means an overpriced car, a house in, a, in an overpriced estate, and sorry, colleagues who live in Joburg, because that's, that's mostly what you pay for. And with this false idea of safety, I will create a community. How many of you do you know that you could, in fact, say, your child is playing with my child and I'm safe because I think I understand the values which you raise, with which you raise your, your children, 
and I subscribe to as well. So there's quite a lot of, of sort of a radical approach that we need to have as parents to say, the R system just don't work. I'm lucky, of course. People always say, well, but your wife doesn't work. I'm like, my wife works. It's just unpaid labor. She does a lot of work at home. In fact, I wouldn't have a job I have and end the money I am if she wasn't there because she does a lot of unpaid labor. So as soon as man recognizes that there is nothing called a housewife, there is nothing called a stay-at-home mom. Because staying at home, ask fathers to stay at home for what for two days or one day. I mean, no, make it five hours with children the whole time. And, and say, no, no, you're not working, you're just chill. You're probably watching TV. No, it doesn't happen like that. So the sooner as parents, as young parents particularly, start shifting our thinking of, and, and, and drastically dismantling the language as well. There's nothing called a housewife. There's nothing called a stay-at-home mom because that has a connotation that these people are sitting at home and polishing their nails, putting on the lipstick and checking the new high heels and shopping online because, you know, parenting is that. No, it's not that. A friend of mine on the last one, Ashanti, a friend of mine, we just had a chat um, today. He, he says parenting is an irris irrational act that we keep on doing. We know it's so difficult, but we just keep on doing. We just keep on having children, but we know it's so irrational because we have no idea how to do it. We have no idea how to do it. Um, part of, of, of what parenting does, it reflects our own traumas. And that's why I say, if I were to become a president of this country, part of what I'll do, I'll have every city in this country crawling with psychologists and social workers just to deal with the trauma that we deal with. Because what you see with gender-based violence, what you mm. see with crime, it is just a symptom of how we are raised and how the context of which we grew up. So, I mean, this is part of the content that we then need to change. We change the content in how, in our minds and how we think our families and how we think about our children and how we think about our lives and the system that we work with. Because the system isn't for us. We must mm -hmm. understand that it's not for us. We must make sure that we dismantle it so that the ch our children can control the system or dismantle it completely or don't subscribe to it and still be able to thrive because we don't want them to survive. We're surviving. They must thrive. And I don't want to be a survivor but I don't want my children to be survivors. I just want them to strive, so. Mm -hmm. well, that's so. That's so profound. I hear that whole, you know, parenting is an irrational act. And I think also the older I get, I also don't have any kids near, but the more I think about it also now with this COVID, the more I'm like, yo, the stress, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Like my friend, it's a trap, it's a trap. <laughs> Like I'm out here trying to like just deal with me and like take care of me. Now imagine like also just the cost of pampers, like the stress, just thinking about it, you know. And I think <laughs> and now I want to bring you in here because I did um the I cost did some, of, yeah. of parenting is really, really high. And not just the monetary value of it, is the it's the cost of time, it's the cost of having emotional intelligence, it's the cost mm. of, of actually are you even fully as are you even full as a person? actually like are you actually full as a person you know and i actually want to just touch on going back to um, what was spoken about earlier i think it's, it's small changes like instead of saying i think how sunday just mentioned it now but ha not having um gender being the face of everything all the time like i'm all for woman empowerment because it is definitely needed you know especially black women in the society that we live in we need an extra step up guys we really do need someone to give us that push more you know we do need that we need to see our faces people that look like us in, in boardrooms and important rooms making important decisions because that's the only way we actually be able to be vocal more about our issues as women and um, wouldn't have another woman in the room you know you have companies that are literally the directors are all male talking about sanitary products you know, like things like that need to be changed, you know, like having, um, I, I would love to touch on maybe having the thing like, I, and, I, and I love it and I support it, taking a girl child to work day, you know, I love that. I think it's important, but now the girl child goes to work and sees what is done. What is the boy child doing that day? Yeah, now when's that? You know, where is that boy child, you know, that day? And does he not feel sidelined? Does he not feel left out already as a child? You know, kids feel left out for silly things. Kids feel left out with their friends going to the bathroom and they're not going with them, you know? So now things like that, where you see it on TV, you see it on billboards, you see all these great initiatives about, like, I, I surely I'd ask for my son too, like if I, if, I have a, if I ever have a son, I'm like, I want him to go to work too, you know? But like, what day is his day? Can't it just be take a child to work day? Because all the kids need to actually see what happens mm -hmm. in the space. 
where people mm. work and people do jobs and people have do these everyday activities should not all the kids be saying that stuff you know should that not be how it's supposed to be where we're equipping all of them equally in a very unequal world already why are we then segregating them so early on you know mm. it does really go back to how the language at home thing matters i think even now I read a lot on twitter about different parenting styles and just having accountability as a parent really matters you know my child is only 21 next month but dare do something that that, that upset so i apologize my baby i'm so sorry you're playing with that toy let me give it back to you you know it's small mm. acts like that that actually open up a better safer space for kids to be able to understand first of all the emotions you know like if she's having a cry i'm like baby i'm sorry have a cry you know whatever what's wrong you know i ask her things like that she's one she can't talk to me as yet but being able to just understand that and i know that's how i want to raise her being able to be a vocal person about whatever's troubling them being able to letting her cry things out if she needs to cry things out so i think it's such an important discussion to have how we actually speak to our children in the home space that really really matters mm -hmm. you know because mm -hmm. that's who they carry themselves as when they leave the house that's who they are when they go to work who they are when they go to school that's how they navigate the world in general so being able yeah. to actually have safe spaces at the house is really important and unfortunately we live in a country where it's so unequal that you have kids that are raised by both parents kids majority raised by single parents with no father figures um i'm one of those kids um kids that are raised by oko oko you know i first of all you know i think what we do we do a survival checklist more than anything else and i think that's the problem a lot of the times we just do survival kits and that's also how we are just the structure is in south africa unfortunately you know we have a coco who go to by themselves single-handedly having to raise all those kids lomo is already first of all quite old they shouldn't be dealing with these kind of things so i feel like even the parenting structure that we actually live in south africa is also slightly an issue and we don't not we don't raise in villages anymore it's also another problem mm. when we had mm. when we had villages that be a house that had all the moms and all the kids would go there the whole day while the men went out to hunt and play we don't live in villages anymore we scared to even send our kids to the next door neighbor so mm. i feel like we have so many other problems that we deal with in terms of even navigating parenthood that obviously does has have umtelela in how we are raising our kids and how we actually start labeling our kids you know so i feel yeah. like maybe that's a certain way to maybe to try and look yeah. things and decipher you know and i and i think you said something you said something really that resonates with me i think the whole concept of accountability right like accountability is important within parenting. And I think further than that, and as a segue to the next question, is the role that your family generally, speaking about it takes a village to raise a child. If we're no longer living in villages, who's raising the child then, right? So what are the what is the role that the family plays in the in the messages and what we're saying to girls and boys? And what should be the messaging if the if what we're saying as it is is not working right like what should be the messaging if we're saying that we want to raise strong healthy well-rounded individual who have the capacity to have healthy interpersonal relationships and i think for me here what it would be is an example of there's a baby girl born into a new family all of the men in that family how are they treating all of the women in that family like how is that child growing up, what, what is she seeing in terms of how men must treat women and how women must engage with all of that? Like, you know, what is the role broader than just the parents because you are born into a family at the end of the day? Um, I think, can I just, just want to have a point because I yes. know that's what you're saying. And I'm sorry, guys. Um, I think just recently I've just been talking a lot about this stuff, you know. Um, for me, I would just, I want to talk about in the elements of, of one fear that I have around men in general. I'm uncomfortable with men even in an elevator. I'm uncomfortable with a man walking close to me in a shop. I'm uncomfortable with any man that I do not know. Already that is a very big problem in how I see men in general. From the get go. You know, so for me, now having a young girl, um, I will tell you that be it at a, at a family function and there's lots of men outside or, you know, um, maybe from the neighbor's house, whatever, I would not be comfortable not having my child in my eyesight. Mm -hmm. And that is not okay. That is mm -hmm. so scary. Or was even at a very happy moment, just the thought of leaving my daughter unattended to by mm -hmm. other men 
in the same space as myself makes me uncomfortable because mm-hmm. I really worry, go to goodness gracious me, what's going to happen to my child? What's going to happen to my daughter? You know, and I think that even changes how we view men. We're not seeing men as men. We're seeing men as people to be fearful of. And that for me is a big problem, but it's just how we are. It's just how we live. It's just the state that we're in right now where men make us scared, men make us fearful, men make us uncomfortable, even more so when you have a newborn child who's defenseless. So having a group of men in my household personally would not be settling to me already that is a problem. I think that's why I want to speak first that maybe the conversation will lead to how we can appease this situation that we in already. It's, it just makes me uncomfortable. You know, having people who are working in the house, I had to ask um, my, my, my daughter's nanny, just please be in the room with her all the time. That should not be how we live. That should mm-hmm. not be okay. So I think there needs to be a, a, a deeper issue about how men actually address or interact with children in general. If you see a man walking with a child, like just in the afternoon, what's the first thought that you have? Do you think, oh, that's the dad, that's the uncle? That is not what you think. You think, oh my God, where's the child going with that person? Mm-hmm. That's what I always think. Yeah. I never first think, was, oh, manu First inclination is fear. First of all, mm-hmm. first thing I see Yes, I but we my with the little girl, look with this little boy, we have night, you know. Only then mm-hmm. to maybe see how they interact with each other, do I then feel better? But my first inclination is always to worry. So I think that's why maybe I would like, I don't know, the panelists can help us in this mm-hmm. nest of a state yeah. that we actually are in, that I'm personally in. Okay, can I can uh, I come in, Linda, if, if you don't mind? It's um I think we have to recognize it for what it is at, at, at this point and, and um, without trying to sugarcoat it. I mean, it's trauma. That's what it is. And it's a very justified trauma. So accept it as justified trauma because um, as men and as society, we have not covered ourselves in glory. Um, and, and also, I just find it, I find the whole concept of, yeah, they said animals. And I think animals are such fantastic beings. They, they wave more fantastic than what I've seen. It's, 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 it's very difficult to um, try and explain the kind of acts that we do, violence that we have, and uh, uh, to animal behavior, because animal behavior is is, is very rational most of the time, mm. and quite often can be justified. So, so Linda, I, I personally, as, as a man, and I'm not talking on behalf of men at all, but it's just to say, it is valid fear, um, and it's not um, it's not undue, and it's something that is just it's heavy. It's heavy um, for me as a father to say, how do I raise two black girls in this country. Um, I, I have a lot of thoughts about what happens when they are 15 years old. Do I already think of leaving the country and go elsewhere? Because I've been places where kids, things happen, yes, but kids, can, teenagers can go and have a drink and come back um, a little drunk, a little tipsy, and they're still fine. Even if they're not drinking anything, but they can get onto a train and come back but this country will not happen. So I'm starting to put a list of where the clubs are. So I would know where my daughter is. I'll be like that creepy father who's the next club until two as well, just hanging out. When she comes, I'm like, oh, coincidence, you are here. Let's go home. Because I cannot, you cannot put a child on, you know, your daughter, you cannot allow your daughter to get into an Uber because things happen in an Uber. Um, A friend can't bring your child home, even if they left together, a boyfriend, a boyfriend, not as in, you know, romantic relationship, because you just don't know what's going to happen next. So it's firstly just acknowledging that the validity of those fears, to say it's, it's very valid fear. Every time I try to speak, the rain starts to rain again, um, the weather starts to rain again. Um, I think I'm being sabotaged. So they, they, they yeah, that's yeah, me. You're speaking truth to power. You're speaking truth to power, so continue. <laughs> to, to the system that raised me, right? Um, <laughs> Um, because I'm raised in a very patriarchal space and it's an acknowledgement that every man should at least go through. And that's the part of trauma that I'm talking about, that you heal that trauma. Because I don't want, I, I want to cut it. I just want to cut it so that my children don't even have to deal with it. So if I deal with um, this trauma myself, then I don't have to have another Linda feeling that if I'm around man, this is how I'm going to, you know, this is how I see them. I don't see, um, oh, what an interesting Man, what an interesting uncle, what an interesting relationship between a daughter and a father. But you cannot have those because you just don't know. And you're absolutely right, Linda. Um, and I think for me, on, on the question that you raised, Ashanti, it's it's there's one thing. We need to recognize again that children are active social agents. And um, they don't learn out of the words we say. 
they learn out of what we do. Us and see us uh, um, behave in a certain manner, they, that's how they learn. So if as a, as a man in the house, you sit there and you sit in your couch and, and read a newspaper and never go to the kitchen to cook, that's what they think men do. As a man, that's what I do. Like you, you drive, um, you bring in food, um, you leave your dishes exactly where you were eating uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, there's my wife is going to pick up after, she's going to pick up after myself. Then children internalize that. So it's not so much about the words we say, because we can say a lot of fancy words to children, but children don't take much of that. They take more, oh, this is beautiful. They take more of what we do rather than okay, what we you. say. So that's the sort of realization we need to get to, to say we, 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 are, we, are, we are mirrors or we are sort of a, 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 a moving curricula, an everyday curricula for children to say, you know what, my mom comes home tired. My father's already cooked. Um, my father's already changing an AP of my younger sister, my younger, my younger brother, because that's just how it should be. And the thing is, I think there's, it's a problematic system again, because men who do that, they get undue, it's like you, you, they get undue credit. You are basically giving credit to fish for swimming. As a father, I mean, fathers say I'm babysitting. Like, excuse me, you're babysitting your own child. No, you're being a parent, you're parenting. You're not babysitting the children. So it starts in that language, in that attitude that, then, I mean, I have a problem with a lot of women generally in, in my space. When I'm, I'm doing things that I think they are parenting that are my duties to do, then you get credit. And you think to yourself, is it that bad that being a parent and- Yes, it's that parent, bad. Then, <laughs> then it's like, oh, wow. no, it, but it, it's undue yes. though. It's undue. You're saying to fish like, well done, move those feet. But, <laughs> but guys, I need to- I need to- break that, in the water. <laughs> I need to, that's, that's the whole point. This is part of the reason why these conversations are so timely is because the bar is so low. We are it's so divorced from what it means to be human, you know? So like yeah, that, it, it's like, that is the truth. It's that low. That is why we are ce celebrating even basic decency. And I think you have a point there, but we need to stop doing that. We need to, we need to expect the basic decency. Yeah, yeah. So, and if someone expects a gold star, you must also just know, but this is what you need to be doing. Monta, oh, I saw you had your hand up. Sorry, she had her hand up. <laughs> um, yes, I did. Um, so, you know, when it, when it comes to roles that family play in, in how kids become as adults, mm. it, I, I find it very deep and part sad and so much hard work for black people. Um, sad because as a family, our parents have their own traumas, right? And their parents have their own traumas simply for being black. There's traumas that they are dealing with. And those are people that are then expected to raise well-rounded individuals as a traumatic generation on their own with their own issues. And we all know as a panel here, as black people, we actually don't even know our parents' traumas because our parents don't talk to us about what they are going through. Now, those people are expected to contribute to the people that are going to be good people in society, and the, those should be us, and we should then pass that on to our children. But we, we then see a trend of a shared trauma of Black youth, and you can attribute things like drinking excessively to those things. I wholly do that. Um, well, attribute the drinking, not drinking excessively. <laughs> Um, but you, you, you see a shared trauma that Black people have. Black people are expected to excel at work. Um, the bare minimum for a Black person is an A. <laughs> um, because we are, hurt, we are raised by people that are so hurt, we are expected to be better than them by any means necessary, even though they are not equipped to help you excel. Um, and then as a family, not even as a family in terms of community, but as a family in terms of your neutral family, for example, if you're from a, a family of a single mother, outside of her own trauma with a black family is a trauma of a woman that was left with child that needs to raise this child to be a thriving adult. So now this is double trauma of the single mom who's a black woman, triple trauma because she's a woman, okay, in South Africa. And this person then, how are they going to raise a woman that can trust men when her words are, do not trust them? 
not even just words her lived experiences her lived experience oh, do not trust them you know it, it's so hard to undo things like that because you as a girl also grow up naturally you want to be with a man it's nice to be dating but at the core of it it's hard you, to trust because you've seen someone that had you with your mother not be an active parent or not even be in the picture at all so we before we even get to just thriving we've got so much undoing that we have to do as black people and unfortunately it's going to take so much work and we're going to need black men to be involved in some way because we are not only dealing with just patriarchy but we're dealing with just black trauma yes mm-hmm. 100% cuz i think Golden, that's fine. <laughs> We're right. We've got 15 no, minutes left. So I want to wrap up this uh, question and then for us to do final thoughts. Yeah, but go for it. Yeah, sorry. I just love what she's saying now about the lived experience of the trauma. Like for me, mm-hmm. I am a child of trauma in that sense where my my, my father lived. Guys, when I say down the road, I'd see him passing a thing and seeing what by accident. Do you understand how traumatic that actually is as a young woman who has to now find love has to now find a man that they can actually see upon and rely upon and want to build a family with you know when the first heartbreak a young woman ever experiences is from their own father 9 100%. out of 10 times first heartbreak you ever experience as a young woman especially a black woman is from mabako already you already have that trauma that you just have to navigate with but for me i feel that what my mother did for me was empower me in the sense of her actions and her words my mom was very vocal with me about almost everything on earth like there's really no conversation that we had with her that was a bit tense or a bit awkward but i feel like that's a decision she made on her own that's a decision that she had to keep making every day and a commitment that she had to make every day even in terms about speaking to me honestly about the struggles of being a single parent you know she didn't glorify mm. it for me and say oh i did this i'm a superwoman you know everyone can do this no what isn't the thing like being a babes jesus jesus said two people must make a child because it will take two people to raise it you know mm. she was fortunate to have a partner and have people with her that became her partners but the sole partner that she was supposed to have being my father when i say go So I was fortunate mm-hmm. to have a stepdad was able to raise the father for me and be a great man and be everything that I need to see but if I had not seen that through my stepfather if my mother hadn't spoken to me about that how would I ever know what a man is supposed to do in the first place because mm-hmm. most of us mm-hmm. grow up with men as my bad or my little bit suddenly or play any vital roles in our children's lives mm-hmm. you know bakona but bakuto maluma bolana or put or whoever they all have their own issues that they're dealing with already their own traumas that they have to face and deal with and their own demons that they need mm-hmm. to face with every single day So even raising a child in a house where most parents are single parents how will they know how men are even supposed to interact or with the opposite sex from them never actually even seeing it in in fact you know the negative big pen and with tv most romance ro- most romances or family units are white and the aunt of black people you know obviously now that is changing slowly but we don't see ourselves in spaces of love and commitment long long ago oh koko bethu oh koko bethu ibona mabe shada mabe nengane you know even from cool when they were about 5 but of course I wish that they won't go over back about 5 and won't go as won't go fast back about 5 and able to support all of these five vibes you know but now that has also changed so my whole thing is that how are we actually able to even see love or see interaction with opposite sex when we don't even have it at home in the first place mm-hmm. so it kind of makes it hard to even recognize it as part of the house yeah yeah that's so important i think just like that whole thing of seeing the love story i guess between your parents how that plays out and what that means and how that affects you, you know like my parents got divorced very early and then a year later my dad committed suicide it was a thing you know so seeing how seeing how your parents and your family members and your aunts and your uncles engage with each other treat each other is so profound and so important especially for young girls growing up now wanting to find proper love and similarly i think with men who don't treat women properly every man every bastard has an origin story <laughs> that's the thing everyone has an origin story of something happened that broke me so therefore i'm just going to go around breaking people you know and um so yeah to me i want to bring you in here what do you think mama in terms of the role that family plays here yeah um i i must say i also have found on this side so i just wanted to say my few cents before i i get cut off but i just quickly wanted to go back we issue a resolinda around umtanake and how she feels when there are men around 
So for me, like who Sandil was saying, it's a traumatized reaction or oh mama who's anxious. And I also mm. have a daughter and I feel exactly the same way. I feel very anxious when there are men around or mangengambon. It's like, I have to see you, you must see me. So as an anxious parent, I'm also raising an anxious girl because mm. then she's growing up anxious. And then I, I, I sometimes think, how far is this going to go? Because now she's growing up and she has internalized I also have a young man who the other day asked me, Guti, why am I suspect all the time? As a young man, I'm a suspect for something that I don't even know. So those are very difficult kind of issues that are playing out in our society. Mm. And mm. then for me, as in kind of looking forward or thinking about what do we do then? I'm also very aware that my area of influence, Ila, mm. that whatever change that I can implement or begin to implement, it will start la, who area I am of influence, my family. And as the conversation has been happening, the language I use, the actions that I show, because they speak louder than words. But also I think what we are doing now this is our area of influence, the space where we can talk and share and discuss. And somewhere, somewhere along the line, someone is thinking differently and, and saying, wow, I wasn't aware of this, or I didn't think of things this way. And already things will start to change slowly because if we look at the whole elephant, it just feels like, my goodness, where are we going to start? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's just my, final contributions almost. Oh, thanks, Timmy. Sini, I want you to engage us on this question and then I'm going to ask everyone to give us our their final thoughts in the last eight minutes of this conversation. So we're asking the question around family roles, the role of the family. I think I think listening to all my panelists, I could see that we, we all have ideas in terms of what is our role as mothers or fathers in raising our girl or a boy child. But we, what we need to really take into consideration is our extended family. Because sometimes as a mother or a father, you know very well how you would like to raise your child. Then you have a grandmother, they will come and say the very same things that you oppose as a child, as a mother, and you do not want your child to learn this thing. But then your child go and visit the grandmother for the weekend or during school holidays, they come back with exactly that kind of information that now they think it's also good because they've learned it from the grandmother, from the aunt, from the extended family. So I think actually we really need to think hard because as much as we try and educate our young ones on these things, but sometimes the extended family has a role um, that they play behind our scenes or sometimes that we're not even aware that they are being groomed either to actually practice this thing that we think, for example, uh, I always say to my daughter, it's not so much important getting married. What is important is actually pursue your career and be independent and know what you want to do with your life. One day she came and said, I'll be walking like this down the aisle. I'm thinking, where you got the down the aisle thing from? Oh, my granny said I must get married. So it's not about so much not getting married, but you don't want getting married to be the most important thing that happens in your daughter's life. You want mm -hmm. your daughter to think education, I must be independent, I must wait, it should come first. But the influence of the extended family goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we, we always say um, kids are being raised by their single mothers. And of course that's true because statistics shows that 75% of um, the children in South Africa are raised by their single mothers, which is a big number. But do we know that even those absent fathers are still sending messages to their boy child. Because if this boy child is being raised by an absent father, what message is he getting? Is it not getting the idea that I can also go imp impregnate a girl and dump that baby somewhere and the child will raise like how I also um, grew up without my father? Some of them might actually take that as a lesson and, they, and off they go, they practice exactly that. So I want to say we mustn't forget these absent people and think that they, they have no messages. Um, I think Sandile and Linda said it's actions. It's what parents do than what they say. They so say. as much as these fathers are absent, 
But do we know that they're sending messages and they're doing something that their sons will one day copy and actually start practicing? And mm -hmm. I think for me, how then the single mothers are going to manage this? Because it's a message that it's already there that you can't control as a single mother and your son is or your daughter is already learning this as something that they think it's, it's okay because it's happening. So I will say parents shouldn't be really shying away from discussing this with their um, children. They mustn't actually make it as if it's, it was a nice thing. They must talk about the difficulties of going through this. They must actually be open so that their kids will know how difficult it is. But also in terms of um, understanding the, the patriarchal messages that the uh, family members can actually pass on into our kids. I think we need, to, again, to help them understand that normally people worry about what people will say. You know, for example, if my husband hangs the washing on the line, my mother-in-law says, but why my, my son is hanging a washing when you're there, what people will say. So I think at some point, we need to find a way of managing what people will say, because that's what stops people from actually changing and start implementing things that will help us as a country move forward because we worry a lot about what mm. people will say if we change mm. what is known as a norm. So how then do we teach our girls to accept and do things that are not seen as a norm and actually not being care about what people will say? As long as mm. those things make them happy, then they must do it. They must actually not worry about what people will say. I think yeah, if we I'm could all stop worrying about what people will say and start worrying about our own happiness, will actually be able to move forward. Yeah, that's so true, that's so true. And I think in closing, it's important to also realize that people will always talk. Whether you're doing good, whether you're doing bad, whether you're doing mediocre, people will always talk. So that shouldn't even be an, a consideration. And I do think that that is a disease of what will people say? You can't be talking about these things during the people. So. We need to really just double down on that. So I'm going to ask you, Manso, and then you do me, then Sandela, then Linda, and then you, um, Sisney, you to give us closing thoughts from today's conversation. In the last three minutes of this conversation, what do you think, given all that we've covered today, I mean, this is a very complex and nuanced issue. What should people take away? What do you think people must take away from your contribution today? Closing thoughts. Um, I think, my biggest thing for me, and like I said earlier on that I'm helping raise my brother. Um, and it's such a challenge because it's, I've only been doing it for just over two years. Um, but it needs you to be present. And I think that's what we need to really enforce. And, and it's uncomfortable and it's probably something that a lot of people are not able to do, but parenting needs to be a very, um, you need to be intentional when you're doing it. Um, that way you can you can raise a person that you're also proud to be raising. You need to be intentional in the sense that you need to remember your own traumas are your traumas. They shouldn't be passed on to the next generation. Um, we need to raise kids that aren't raised by schools and the schooling system. Unfortunately, a lot of parents, like Linda said earlier, they're working, they're not a bit, uh, uh, able to do a lot of things that they'd like to do with their families. But unfortunately, the only way South Africa can move forward with a better people is for humans to be involved and communicate at home first before you even think of the schooling system that is not doing Thank much you. for the people um but yeah we need to my biggest thing if you take anything away from this from me is that we need to flip and find a way to not move forward with traumas of past generations break the intergenerational cycles of trauma yeah. do we closing thoughts mama Thank you. I think I agree with what has just been said. It's not easy. It's tough. Um, being a parent, life is just um, a bit difficult sometimes. But we all have a role to play. And I think even if you have that hour, use it wisely and raise emotionally intelligent young people, children, not boys or girls, just children. Thank you. Thank you. Closing thoughts. Thank you so much. One sentence for me. Disrupting the system is, is the only revolutionary act uh, that is in our only hope of living a better world for our society, for, for our children. I don't think there's any other option. You disrupt the system, and that's a revolutionary act we can do as parents. Thank you. Thank you. Linda? 
Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, well, well, I'll be first <laughs> um, I just really want to say that the, today's conversation is as broad as it is. I think we all echo the same sentiments. You know, we both feel the frustrations of raising children in, in, in our climate, you know, and then oftentimes I myself think, should we invest in making sure that by the time she's old, we actually live abroad? Is that a safer place for her? But then my thing is that, am I leaving it better than what, what it is right now? You know, what changes are you actually implementing in your circle, in your family, in your life, in the decision that you are currently making right now that you feel will have a better outcome for another generation? That generation being your neighbor's child, being a sister's child, being just a child in the street. How are you impacting that person's life when you see them? Are the words that you speak upon children being words that are uplifting? Is it words that are linked with actions that have a, a, a deeper meaning of a change? Are you letting children be children? You know, are you allowing children to be in a space of allowing them to actually be themselves and be in and, and, and be free and be safe? You know, so one thing I like to people to take away from our conversation today is that we shouldn't be fearful of raising our children and be fearful of other humans for that, that reason. We, mm -hmm. we, we should raise our kids in safe spaces, in safe circles with people that are like-minded in the sense that we all want the greater good at the end of everything else. We all want to leave a really great impact in this world and that world is for our children to have behind. Are we leaving it better? That I think applies to nature. It applies to how we orient ourselves as people. Are we actually leaving a better a, a better future than what we yeah. want? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Sisini, last closing thought. Okay, I think, I think for me, I'm gonna be quick is that um, actually as, as parents, we, we, some of us are parents here in this panel, some of us are not, but we, we, today I'm sure we've learned that there are some options and, and healthy options or healthy ways that one can actually take um, forward in order to try and change the system so that our kids are not being raised in a society that um, they, we even scared um, for them to go out. So we can mm -hmm. actually change some of this a particular um, 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 issues that are happening around us and educate them about it. But what I want to say to um, the young people um, or to parents as well, is that one thing that I think we need to do is to teach our boys and girls to love themselves first before they even attempt loving another person. Because if they love themselves and they're in peace with themselves, they will have healthy self-esteem. Violence normally comes because people are not at peace with who they are and they don't have that healthy um, self-esteem. So if we could all try and raise our <laughs> boys and girls to have a healthy self-esteem, we will actually um, have less of the issues that we're currently having. Thank you. 100%. Oh, a special thank you to all of you. Thank you so, so much for joining me today. And thank you to all of you who watched this amazingly deep, complex, emotional for me conversation. Um, please join us next week. Next week, we're talking about the glass ceiling and smashing it at work. Yes. Same time, same place next week. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>